In my recent interview with Harris Epanos, we dove into the topic of fructose and whether fructose is the cause of metabolic syndrome and leptin resistance. And it can certainly play a role, but maybe it's a little bit more complex than that. So I want to invite you to listen to Harry's take on fructose, obesity, and whether fructose is the cause of all evil. The other day I was watching a presentation with Dr. Richard Johnson at the Metabolic Health Summit where he was talking about how fructose is the survival nutrient and that it triggers metabolic syndrome and leptin resistance and everything, like inflammation, everything that follows with that. And that that comes from a low ATP state as well, just as Chichirim does. I would love to hear your take on this if you have an opinion because it's the first time that I hear about fructose is the reason, like the one reason, which, by the way, can be stimulated through any high carb diet via the polio pathway. And if this is true, how come that people on a very low carb diet, people, some people, I should say, still struggle with leptin resistance? Or do you think that this view is a bit reductionistic and that we really need to kind of look more into the into the quantum biology to explain why this is happening. I, I think it is a bit a bit reductionistic in that mm -hmm. regard. Obviously, fructose has a much higher threshold of the uh, um, deuterium in that regard, but at the same time, it's processed differently because it goes to the liver. It get, gets repackaged into fat, no different because it uses similar pathways as alcohol. Um, Robert Lustig's done a lot of research in that regard and actually shown that. Even with young kids, if you give them just junk food, pure fr fructose, give them 50% fructose, 50% um, glucose, um, starch in the form of starch, and you give the other kids the same isocaloric in terms of starch, the kids on the pure starch intake, you'll have to increase their intake in order to prevent them from having any fat loss or weight loss in that regard. But the, the kids that were actually on the fructose, they were putting on, stacking it on. So it's quite clear that that is a well, and it's not only in humans, it's, it's in all species. I mean, I've talked about how fructose, you know, like fruit trees in the Amazon basin, how when there's two seasons when it's the water levels, are, there's a lot of rain and the water levels are much higher. What happens is there is these fish that come down from the deep, the depth that are about that size, and then they grow to that size just eating pure fruit. So it's quite clearly that fruit, the bears, they will sit and consume like 10,000 grapes in one sitting. Fructose definitely drives the increase in fat storage, the increase in adiposity. So that's that's well established in uh, throughout the animal kingdom. Um, it's quite clear it does cause a lot of these derangements, like uh, sort of leptin resistance. In well, I don't like the word leptin. It, it raises it, it. It basically has an effect on leptin signaling. And this is why I don't like using the word leptin resistance because it's not a resistance to leptin. What it's doing is is actually circumventing that signaling deliberately because it is a mechanism where even certain genes are upregulated. So it's quite clear that it's not like some sort of, you know, nasty resistance that just takes hold of the body um, because of, uh, you know, it's like if you think about it, I take, let's say I take a, a hammer and I throw it into a machine, that's going to stop that machine. That's not what's happening in us. It's basically... It's basically toning down the signaling. So, and that's deliberate because it wants you to overeat. It's to cause you to overeat by toning down that signaling, because lep, you know, of the the leptin, you know, signaling that that that's happening. Yeah. You basically will continue eating. Yeah. And the whole purpose is to if you're in an in an interglacial period where the animals are not as fat, the leaner, you need that seasonal fructose to fatten up. The huds they use it, they use honey, they use some fruit, seasonal stuff, again, for the same reason, in order to fatten up and increase their adiposity so they've got it for the rest of the year. And that's why all tribal people you'll see in those sort of periods of, of plenty, as it's called, you know, they'll put on a bit of body fat 
and then they'll lose it and lean out to a six pack by you know by the end of the that season you know the 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 more leaner seasons and then back when that comes they'll they'll gorge on all this sort of stuff to basically build up their adipose tissue so that's well established it's quite it's quite clear that what is happening and all that it is a bit reductionist to think that um in those sort of terms because there is also a component of the randall cycle that's also playing here and there is also a component of deuterium as well that's actually slowing down because um the highest the part of the of the plant that has the highest amount of deuterium is the fruit and it's also used as a it's also a growth factor that that a lot of species use it like the bees well actually as they fly around for the pollen and stuff like that because that's you know they'll actually they'll actually send out sort of you know sort of frequencies that actually can vibrate and they can receive back the frequencies of certain sort of uh, flowers that will go on to become fruit, but those flowers that have actually got more deuterium in them. So they'll actually, there's a different um, signal that will come back that will on their receptor sites, and they will go to that and actually, because they use the growth, that is a growth factor. So the bees will put that in, and that's why um, honey is very high in deuterium as well. Um, the the sugar part of that um, component and sort of the part of the waxy part material as well and the protein parts as well. That's why they're more firm and stiffer, you know, the structure that they build. That's why I believe that these things are contraindicated. It's fine for bees and their survival and what they do and stuff like that. But um, humans having it seasonally a bit here and there, fine. But all year round, um, like our dear friend uh, Dr. Saladino does, probably not a good idea. In that regard, you just have to look at his face, past and present photos, and they'll tell you everything. Yeah. You just have to look at Bart's my face and all that. Room. I'm well in September. I'll be fifty eight, and you only have to look at his, and he's in his forties, and his skin doesn't look that good. And I go out, and people know I go out in the sun continuously, and through the through the summer, my my skin can be quite red from from hours of exposure in the sun. So it's not the sun, guys getting enough retinol to, and vitamin D to regulate the, the matrix mental proteinases, the collagen degrading enzyme inside the and inside the skin and regulate them, you're not going to get a lot of this sort of deterioration. The thing that upregulates MMPs in the skin is fructose. So if you're consuming high fructose stuff, you're going to be actually increasing MMPs and deranging your collagen structures of your skin. So, you know, unfortunately, Paul, for whatever reason, I, I don't know why people do certain things and why they get convinced a sort of attitude towards things. But mm, but I would say that most people, the way they view leptin is in a very reductionist sort of way and all that. And so the threshold of fructose can vary the effect of uh, that. So it's not an on-off you know, thing. You can actually have some variability. Some people, if, even if they have a, a small amount, like let's say a bit of honey or a bit of fruit now and then, like a few berries and stuff like that, they're not going to get leptin resistance. So it depends on the threshold, obviously. And most animals that actually utilize fructose for the purposes of building up body fat very rapidly, they know that they have, they have different thresholds, like bears have to eat a lot in order to induce a lot of that different animals have different thresholds so there is variability there as well so the signaling that actually is caused by fructose is going to be variable um, between species as well so there's a lot of there's a lot of um things but it's not the only thing and people need to realize that just because you get certain fructose signaling to encourage you to eat more so you'll end up storing um more of that fructose so that's also it's affecting your psychology in a sense your addictive behavior actually taurine can actually suppress that addictive behavior it's actually good for people trying to get off alcohol and many other things and uh, smoking and whatever else it does lower the addictive effect because of the GABA signaling um, so you can counteract certain things in that regard but we shouldn't be too reductionist it's like you know Fructose is pure evil. You know, for your sperm, you actually produce a bit of glucose to provide for your sperm as a male. So, you know, it's not the demon 
But, you know, it's the threshold again. You know, a certain amount is required by a number of tissues, like a certain amount of glucose is required by a number of tissues which the body can produce itself. Uh, but excess amounts or beyond certain thresholds, there can be different varied levels of deleterious effects. Um, so I'm... So I'm much more nuanced in this sort of stuff. I find that a lot of people tend to have this sort of blunt type of approach um, when they look at these things. And it's a it's a system. And the system has got a lot of moving parts and a lot of enzymes and a lot of different nutrients that can affect different pathways and blunt or, or uh, you know, upregulate or downregulate certain pathways. So it can be a complex thing. But the thing that most people miss is the deuterium side. Somebody with a high deuterium load consuming a high fructose diet is going to have a completely different effect than somebody who's got a much lower deuterium threshold as well. So all these things are at play. There's, it's a much more complex um, pitch of a system with a lot of different moving parts and a lot of different things, inputs, that can actually affect the way that system works. So we need to stop being so reductionist and, and thinking it's only fructose or it's only this or it's only it's all of it in a, in a certain synergy and the thresholds that those um, different substrates are in our bodies or being processed through our bodies can have an effect, both positive or negative or variable between the the, the two within the body. Um, so that's the sort of you could say, an important take-home message for many people to understand. And that's why we do notice variability between people, the way they respond to certain foods and all that. And we go, oh, we shouldn't conclude just because somebody can tolerate something at a you know, higher threshold than you that you're the same. You may have more deuterium damage. Yeah. They may not. There's all these var variables. And that's where a lot of people make mistakes because – they are viewing things in a very narrowly reductionist and very narrow perspective rather than taking into consideration a whole lot of factors that can that can interplay. And even our environment, you know, our environment plays a role. There's, you know, people are exposed to mould, they're exposed to all sorts of things in their environment today, other toxins. You could be close to a to a waste dump or a, um, a chemical plant that's actually spewing out certain things. Um, and you're and you're breathing those sort of things in, even at lower amounts, in combination with a whole lot of other things, can have different effects in your body. So it's you know we need to yeah, it's a more complicated picture, so to speak, than some people make out it to be because they like to sort of push a certain narrative or it's something which they're making their career on or whatever.